Well, good morning. Uh, Pastor Richard is in Wilson today, so you and I will get to hang out, see what God was up to today. Uh, Ronnie, thank you for the introduction. I told the first service, he read it almost like I gave it to him. He said almost everything. No, Ronnie, Ronnie's been a good friend as well, and, and nobody else will understand this, but maybe me, Ronnie, and Angie. But Ronnie, uh, Ronnie has a lot of passion when he's coaching, and he gets after it. And, but uh, Ronnie's the real deal, too, and just like many of you, I, I love it because we're, we're all in this thing together. There's no need to put on airs. There's no need to walk around like, you know, we got it all together because ain't none of us got it all together, right? So welcome to Palm Sunday. Today's a, a great day for, uh, for us as we get closer to Easter. And uh, I was thinking this week, I started hearing an old song about because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. You know, oftentimes we, we focus on the death and the burial, but we can't ever forget about the resurrection. That's where our hope comes from, right? Amen. So good to see you today. Uh, I asked the first service, they really like their new time slot to 9 o'clock. But, and you guys, I guess y'all, this is y'all service, right? Y'all like this one. I like this one too because I'm not an early bird. I, I need all the sleep I can get. I need my rest. But it reminds me of a little story I heard about um, this little boy who was in the lobby of the church one day. And there was this plaque up on the wall, and on, on the plaque it had names of, of men and women, and it had American flags all over it. And he was just staring up at it. And the pastor took notice of it, so he walked over there and said, hey, good morning, Johnny. Uh, and the little, uh, Johnny said, uh, good morning, pastor. He said, what is this? And he said, Johnny, this is a, a way that we honor all the men and women who died in service. And little Johnny froze. And he said, Pastor, was it the 9 o'clock or 1045 service? <laughs> I also heard about this pastor who was getting ready to um, preach a sermon. And he was making announcements. And he said at the end of the service, all, uh, we're going to have a meeting of the church board in the back of the sanctuary. So after the service, the church board started gathering around. And the pastor noticed that there was a stranger among them. And so the pastor walked over and said, friend, he said, maybe you misunderstood. This was for the, uh, the church board. He said, pastor, I understood it completely. He said, and I was just as bored as anybody else. <laughs> so I told the first service, if you're bored, don't come tell me you're bored. Just give me an attaboy or, or don't, just pat me on the back. Just, I'm praying for you, brother. But last week, we started a two-part series about... Uh, soul cycles we're talking about emotion you know and i was thinking this morning um you know we're a pentecostal church and pentecostal sometimes gets a bad rap because some people say oh it's just emotionalism and when i was watching carolina michigan state yesterday y'all i had some emotion going on is there something wrong with that I've been to ball games and I've seen people stand up and cheer and, and, and slap one another and kiss each other. I mean, they go after it, don't they? That's the same thing we need to do when we come in here. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of my faith in Jesus. He's been way too good to me. And sometimes it is out of emotion. But sometimes, boy, the tangible presence of God will come down and lay his hand on you right where you are. So don't ever worry about that. Don't, who, ah, who cares about that? But we've been talking about soul cycles and emotional and things that maybe Jesus felt as well. And one of the things we talked about last week, we're going to do a quick review. We talked about how our, our bodies, we're, we're components, that we, are, we live in a physical body, and we have a mind. We have a spirit, and we have a soul, and out of our soul is where our emotions are. That's where it comes from. And I love that because if you remember, when Jesus was asked one day, what was the greatest commandments, he said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. So, so it must not be enough for me just to love God in my mind and be tormented with my emotions and my soul. It must not be enough for me to love God with my soul and my mind, but yet my strength, and I'm doing everything in the world opposite what God wants me to do. I got to love him with all, all of me. When we do that, when we fall in love with Jesus and surrender all of it, oh, man, it takes you to a new level. 
But we're talking about cycles. And the definition of cycle is a series of events that are regularly repeated in the same order. And we get into cycles of emotions, the cycle of, of causing us to make the wrong decisions a lot of times, the wrong choices, the wrong reactions. We react in ways maybe that we shouldn't. And what it does is sometimes it'll hinder. It'll hinder our life, it'll hinder our walk, it'll hinder our witness. So we look at Jesus. Who better to look at, right? And what I love about Jesus is because he came and he took on, he came and took on this, this flesh. The name Emmanuel means that God with us. And although he was fully God, he was fully man. And so he knows what it's like to be hungry and thirsty. He knows what it's like to be hot and tired. And I'm sure sometimes maybe he, he was in a bad mood. I mean, I don't know, but he was a man just like me. I'm sure when he woke up in the morning, he didn't just, as soon as his eyes flung up, he started singing, this is the day that the Lord has made. I mean, some mornings he probably had to, oh, you know, I don't know. But he knows what you're going through. He's felt what you are feeling. I can relate to that. I love that. This is what Hebrews says about it. Hebrews chapter 4, it says, the high priest of ours understands our weakness. Now, who's our high priest? It's Jesus. Jesus, our high priest, understands our weaknesses. Or you could say he understands our emotions. For he faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. So we don't come in our own strength. We can come boldly. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So aren't you thankful for that today? Now, one of the things that Pastor talked about last week was anxiety. I thought he did a great job, and I love the fact that he, in, he was transparent about his own anxiety at times, how he struggles with that. There's no need to try to hide it. We all go through some of the similar things. And in 2020, there was 30, 36% of people showed signs of chronic anxiety, and it's probably higher today. But Jesus had moments of anxiety, and that's what he talked about us last week was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he knew what was about to about to take place but here's what jesus did first of all pastor said that he talked jesus talked to his friends so if you're battling anxiety or stress or depression man don't mask it don't try to be like oh i got it i, I got it i don't need and certainly don't get isolated talk to your friends talk to your inner circle talk to those people who care about you the other one was he said he talked to his father and that's what the scripture tells in Philippians 4. It says, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. Talk to your father. And then Jesus talked to his feelings. If you remember, he said, God, if there, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Then he said, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. So Jesus was saying, I know I'm feeling this anxious right now, but you know what? This will not stop the will of God in my life. And that's what we have to do. We have to have those moments where we talk to ourselves. I, I used to be a manager of a, a bottled water company. And sometimes, you know, when you manage like 12 or 13 people, it can be stressful. You got trucks breaking down, people calling in. There's always something going on. You got your boss man on you. I, there was plenty of days, man, I would go be on my way to uh, home from work, and I would say, I got, I got to do this more. I'd call myself and leave myself a message on the phone. Hey, Troy, don't forget to do this. Don't forget to do that. But sometimes I would remind myself, hey, Troy, you're doing a great job. Don't you let nobody tell you different. You're doing, you're doing great. And I would forget it. And then the next morning, I'd get in, and I'd check my messages, and I'd heard that, I'd heard that pat on the back, Troy, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Sometimes you got to talk to your emotions. Don't let your emotions rule you. Come on, let's go. So Mark chapter 4, 36, that's what Jesus said. He said, not my will, your will be done. So it's time for us to change those cycles, stop those cycles. So the first one we want to talk about today is anger. Everybody say anger. 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 Let me get a bottle of water here. Y'all make me nervous. My mouth gets dry. When I was preparing this week, I read this article from Dr. Saxena. Here's what they said about anger. It said, anger is a normal and healthy emotion that everyone experiences from time to time. It is a natural response to frustration, injustice or threat 
Anger can motivate us to, make, to take action to protect ourselves or to stand up for what we believe in. That sounds good, don't it? Anger is a normal thing. However, anger can also be destructive if it is not expressed in a healthy way. Unmanaged anger can lead to violence, aggression, and relationship problems. Anybody relate to that? Anybody relate to that? I, I, I can. I know I can. You know, anger, everybody handles anger differently. It's not the same for everybody. But I have no doubt that there's people here today, people that are watching maybe, people that are listening, that it's not just anger, but anger is trying to control you. Anger is trying to control your emotions and control your responses. And that's what we've got to get a grip on today. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. I struggle with anger sometimes. Mine comes more of in a cycle. And, and Sean might say different. I don't know. But I think I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky guy. I am moody sometimes. But I'm not an angry individual. But I have times, y'all, that I get just a little bit upset. I get a little passionate, Ronnie. Sometimes, it's because, most of the time when I do, it's because I'm frustrated. I may not even be mad at a particular person, but I'm so frustrated, and that's how it comes out, because I don't know what to do. And sometimes that's where we find ourselves. Sometimes it's, it's some of y'all, y'all don't, y'all are okay until y'all get in that rage cage called a car, and you start driving. And that's when the rage monster comes out. We got any rage monsters in the house? Yeah. Don't ever come up, if you see me, don't ever come up riding me on my rear end. I can't stand it. <laughs> I have a, I, I feel something coming up on me when that happens. And I'm telling you, I slow down. I slow down 10 miles an hour. I don't care. <laughs> You're not going to push me. I'm going to, this is my car. <laughs> Rage. Here's one. Now, I could get the house in an uproar right now. How about political frustration? Boy, if I sat there 10 minutes, I'd have y'all stirred up. Because that's about all it takes me when I start watching the news. And I get frustrated when I hear all this garbage. I hear all this crap that our government's doing. I don't like where we are. I don't like where, where we're headed. That's why we got to pray for them. It don't matter what side you're on. And the thing about anger, man, there's so much anger now in politics. And, and one president, we can't understand some of the things he says. And then we got a former president, we wish he wouldn't say things he said. Ain't nobody perfect. Nobody's got all the answers. He's got the answer. Anyway, I don't, I'm going way too far off of here. Maybe it's your job. Your job, you could be stressful. Maybe it's your, maybe it's your young kids or your teenagers maybe pushing your buttons too much. And you're getting in a cycle of anger. And now it's... Uh, Sean's even made mention sometimes when me and Noah, if when his school work, y'all pray for me. I don't like school. I'm not even in school and I don't like it. <laughs> and Sean will come home sometimes and we're, me and Noah might be arguing about something because I'm frustrated. And she'd be like, it is just the atmosphere. And I'm like, I'm sorry, please show mercy. I'm trying to help this youngin. <laughs> it could be your marriage. Maybe you guys are lashing out at each other and there's, there's tension and, you know, and all these different things. It's a cycle of anger. Did Jesus get angry? He did. He did. Jesus was, his anger was more of righteous anger. It wasn't the soulish anger like we know. People were coming against Jesus. He didn't get mad if you said something about him. He won't worry about, he knows who he is. He won't worry about him. But now he did have a problem with somebody, these religious folks. These folks act like they knew what was going on. They knew the answers. That folks he had a problem with, and he would have some anger. And anger and not, being angry is not a sin, but make no mistake, a soul cycle of anger can lead to sinful behavior. It can be hurtful. You can use vindictive words and actions, and it's not good. Uh, I told the first service years ago, Sean uh, got a subscription to some magazines. Sean, you probably forgot about this. And I'm going I'm to tell the story the way I remember it. <laughs> Y'all pray for her. I mean. But somehow she got, she started, she got to, she signed up for these magazines. And there was a, different magazines. And I saw the calls and I was like, no, I, we can't, I can, we can't do this. So I politely called the 800 number. 
and I talked to the gentleman on the phone and was trying to explain to him that we, were, we, did, we did ask for this, but we respectfully declined, and we would like to get a refund and stop the payments. And he was very respectful and told me, under um, no circumstances, would he do that? <laughs> and the conversation got more heated and more heated. And so finally, y'all, I'm not proud of it, but I had a thought in my mind, okay, if I'm going to still have to pay for this, I'm going to get my money's worth right here. And y'all, I unloaded on the brother. I called him everything I could think of. But in the end, you know what happened? I still had to pay. <laughs> but me acting that way didn't do anybody any good. It was so stupid. I'm glad I've learned from that. Now, most of the time, if I get really angry, I get quiet, and I'll start doing stuff around the house. And I think Sean figured, don't tell her, I think she figured that out. I think sometimes she'll push my button and say, okay, there's some stuff around the house that needs to be done. Let me get. Here's what Ephesians says about it. It says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go, while, go down while you're still angry. That's hard for me to do sometimes because I'm not ready to give in. I'm not ready to say I'm sorry yet. I want to stew about it a little bit. I didn't even say that in the first service. I needed that one. It says, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. It gives a foothold. A lot of times when we get home, Noah's a, a, he's a prankster like I am, and he'll try to get in the door first to lock me out. And sometimes he, he succeeds. He'll lock me out, and I got to, hey, yes, yeah, it's funny. But sometimes I'm quick, and I get my foot in the door. Yeah, I got my foot in the door. Now he, ain't, he, ain't, he can't shut me out. That's what anger does if you don't do something with it. It allows the enemy to have a foothold in there. So we got to be careful with that. Matthew 21, we see Jesus get angry. And he was entering Jerusalem right before the Passover. And you know the Passover is when all the Jews come together and they were celebrating their exodus from Egypt, their freedom from slavery. It's a great time. You know, it's kind of like uh, Times Square at New Year's Eve. I mean, all these people coming in together. But when Jesus walked into the temple, it broke his heart because he saw what was going on. So his, his righteous anger <laughs> rose up. So let's read Matthew chapter 21, 12 and 13. It says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables on the, of the money changers and the benches of those who dove, those doves selling, those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a house den of robbers. You see, this action grabs our attention because Jesus, we know Jesus as loving compassionate, a healer, doing miracles. But there was times where he had righteous anger come up when he saw that people were being taken advantage of or he saw that people were being misled or mistreated. That's when he became angry. And, and he was angry on behalf of those people being mistreated. So he started flipping over tables because it was time to stop this greed and this nonsense in the temple. And in the four Gospels, you can see him angry at different times, but he never got angry at people saying stuff about him. That's what we've got. We can't be easily offended. Not everybody is going to like you. Not everybody likes me. Guess what? I don't like everybody. I love everybody, but the Bible didn't say I had to like everybody. Sometimes I don't even like myself. Y'all ever feel that way? So Jesus oftentimes, when he got angry like that, he would... His response would be to heal and to help. So what is ours? Do we, do we heal and help or do we slice and dice? What are we, what are we doing? You know, and a lot of times I told the first servers, uh, I, like to get, I like to get massages, okay? Has anybody ever had a massage in here? Come on, guys. Let me see some men in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all have had some. Massages, if you never had one, you think it's, it's just like the greatest. You leave so, feeling so great. But it's not always, always so great. You see, sometimes when I get in there and I'm on that table and she gets in my back, she'll hurt, hit a certain spot, and it hurts, and it hurts. And sometimes i got to dig deep, and I'm like, mm. and she say, Troy, is that, uh, are you doing okay? And I'm like, yes, ma'am, I'm doing great. <laughs> this feels great, but it's a knot there. There's something that's uncomfortable, and she's, she's working it out. So anytime I get before you, I want you to be comfortable, but if there are some areas in your heart and your life that need some some pushing and some shoving. That's what I want to do. 
I want to get in your business a little bit. The Holy Spirit wants to work some things out in your life, in your heart, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it hurts, but the end result will be good. It will be good. So here's what I want to talk about for a few minutes is silent anger. When we think of anger, we think of outburst. That's the obvious. But the silent hurt is the one that is, is sometimes the most critical. Because that's when people, they're hurt and they're offended and they keep it inside. And so down, now they've been offended and now it becomes a grudge. And then over time, if it's not dealt with, that grudge becomes bitterness. And that bitterness keeps lingering there and now it's going to be unforgiveness. None of that's good. None of that's healthy. Maybe it could be on your job. Maybe you've been mistreated, over, overlooked. You felt like you got the shaft. You're not appreciated. They keep putting more on you but not giving you more money. But then you get the attitude, well, that's the way it's going to be. I ain't doing no more. I'm going to do just what I can to get by. Maybe it's God. Maybe you're angry at God. Maybe he didn't answer a prayer the way you thought he should in the time that he should. And you're bitter about it. Maybe you don't voice it, but maybe you're secretly, maybe you're angry about it on the inside. Well, God, why did it work out the way? I don't know. But you can trust him. Maybe it's your spouse. Sometimes spouses hurt one another, and all of a sudden they start getting this. They may not express it, but they have this mindset. Oh, well, you, you're not meeting my needs, so I'm not going to meet your needs. Y'all ever been there? If you have, don't tell me, especially if your spouse is right beside you. But it's true. It's true. You can have that mindset. They, they, they treat me that way? All right. We'll see how you like this, Tomcat. We'll see how you like this. You know, there's a, a while back, um, I take Sean's car, I take Noah to school in the mornings, and most of the time I drive her car, and what I started doing a while back was putting gas in her car. I filled up because she gives me the opportunity to serve her by, when I get in her car a lot of times, it's out of gas. <laughs> so that's her way of letting me, you know, be a servant. So, I don't know what it was not too long ago, but I, I think we had some, I think we had some disagreements about something. I don't remember what it was. But I got in her car that morning, and guess what? It was only empty. And it was, God is with us, it was rainy, and it was cold, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah. I ain't putting gas in this car today. It ain't going to happen. And I dropped Noah off at school, and guess where I ended up? I ended up at the gas station. Do you know why I did it? I didn't do it because I felt like it. What's feelings got to do with it? That was my opportunity to say, Troy, you're not going to let your emotions take the best of you right here. You're still going to put gas in this whether you like it or not. And I don't think I went home and told her about it. Sean, I did it for you because I love you. <laughs> but I hope you understand what I'm saying, where I'm going with that. You can't let your emotions... Do that stuff. It's harmful. So do an audit on your emotions today, on your anger. Are you angry? I think I spent a lot of time on that. Maybe I, maybe I should, but God compels us not to seek revenge, but to bless those who curse us and pray for those who mistreat us. 1 Corinthians talks about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, so if that's the, if that's the case, if, if, if I'm a born-again believer and this is the temple of God, I think that I need to do like Jesus did when he went to the temple when he was, he, was, he was angry. He started kicking over them tables and chairs. Sometimes in my life, that's what I have to do. On the inside, I have to kick over some tables of bitterness. I got to kick over some chairs of resentment and unforgiveness. I got to do that in my heart. You got to do that in your heart. I think that's healthy. We got to let go of that stuff. Here's what Ephesians says about it. 31 says, get rid of all bitterness. How much? All. all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. He said, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, filling their car up with gas even though you don't want to, just as God through Christ has given, forgiven you. We got to do that. We got to live what we talk. We can't just talk it. We got to walk it. So we got to we got to get away from our soulish anger and make sure it's a righteous anger. Let's get behind things like let's get righteously angry about all the the enemies trying to do to marriages and homes. Let's let's begin to get righteously angry over that and pray and intercede for those. 
Let's get behind the, uh, abortion issues and things like that. Let's, let's have some righteousness. The church, let's time to stand up and take a stand. Let's do that. So number two, is everybody good so far? Number two, worry. Here's the definition of worry. To give in to an ease, to allow your mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. How many worry, no, I'm gonna, let me ask it this way. How many knows a worry award? Let me see your hands. And don't look to the person beside you because it, it might be them. Some of you, it's you, y'all are owning it, and I appreciate that. But worry is a constant state of anxiety over what might happen. What will it be? And most of the time, we go to the worst case scenario, don't we? You start feeling a little palpitation. Oh, my, oh my God, you start getting on the Internet. What, what does that mean? What, what is that a sign of? You know? It's a possibility. What's the fear of the unknown? It's, it's when concern turns into worry. It crosses that line. We all have concerns. But it's when it, the worry begins to take over. We need to live in peace. Here's what Isaiah 26 says. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. See, when you start having those times, fix your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on him where your peace comes from. Because worry can't take away tomorrow's trouble. It only takes away today's peace. Say it one more time. Worry can't take away tomorrow's trouble. It only takes away today's peace. I remember one night, we, um, it, it was turning cold, and I cut the heater on, and I noticed instead of me getting warmer, it was getting colder. So I went and checked the thermostat before bed, and sure enough, it was running, but it wasn't no heat coming out. And so I laid in the bed, y'all, and I started, I almost crossed over. I started thinking, oh my God, this, this heat system is going out, and I'm going to have to get a new heat system. How much is that going to cost? How am I going to pay for that? And you know what? I'm thankful God that instance. I said, no, I'm not going to sit here and dwell on that. And I went to sleep. I got it right that time, y'all. And you know what? The next day I got up, you know what the problem was? I just needed my tank refilled. I was out of gas. But I could have stayed awake the whole night worrying and fretting. Oh, my God, what if, what if, what if? Thank God I didn't. But that's what worry would do. It will rob you of your rest. It will rob you of your peace, your joy. It will just tear you down. Can't live like that. 60% of Americans struggle with worry and stress every day. And it's, and it's growing. It's never-ending weight that you carry around, and it just robs you. It just robs you in your mind. Here's what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. It says, give all your worries, not some of them, all your worries and cares. To who? To God. Why? Because he cares about you. He cares about you, Cody. He cares about you. He cares about you watching and listening. He's concerned about you. He's for you, not against you. Cast your cares on him. See, when you meditate on these things, that's when peace begins to come in. Worry is rooted in fear. Faith is rooted in trust. Let's, let's choose faith. Most things you worry and fret about don't even happen anyway. They just don't. You can trust God today. You know what? Sometimes your family will let you down. Your government will let you down. Your job, your BFL. You even, left your, you even let yourself down, but God will never let you down. He is faithful. And if God be for you, who could be against you? So let's choose to do that today. Let's choose to change that cycle of worry. And let's choose faith. So we don't read anywhere that Jesus struggled with worry. However, he did talk about it in Matthew chapter 6. And this is the command that he gave us. He said, do not worry about your life. And that's always easier said than done to the person who's in the situation. I get that. But Jesus in this parable talked about a little bit. He talked about how don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth. Don't store up where uh, rust and moss and people steal in and take it. What he was saying was, he don't, God does not care if you have money and things as long as money and things don't have you. Okay? And I can promise you, if you ever get to the point where you begin to live generously in your life, and you begin to 
let it, when you get, when God gives it to you, you give it out. When you live a life of generosity, he, you won't have to worry about it stuff. You take care of his business, he'll take care of yours. Guarantee. Guarantee. But here's what he said in Matthew 6, 25. He said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? It's just so simple. Look, when we send, when I drop Noah off to school tomorrow, I can guarantee you he's not going to be in class thinking, am I going to eat today? Am I going to have food today? He's going to be worried about what he's going to eat, ain't he, Sean? He's a growing boy. What are we, what are we eating, Daddy? What are we eating? I, I understand. He don't go to school worried about what am I going to wear? Am I going to have anything to wear today? Am I going to have clothes to wear today? No, because Father, because his needs are met. He don't live in that mindset of worried about what's going to take place today. Am I going to have this or that? He's not worried about that. That's the same way with us. We need to get to that point where we trust Father. Father knows best. And he said at the end, he said, if you seek me first, the kingdom and my righteousness all these things will be added unto you. So you don't have to have that, that worry. You don't have to carry that burden. Let him loose you from that. He's got you. He's got your life. He knows the beginning from the end. And you don't see it. You don't understand it. But I can promise you, as you surrender yourself to him, all of a sudden you'll look back. Sometimes you don't know what to do. Sometimes it's, doing, sometimes it's just standing and saying, Lord, I trust you. Sometimes it's taking a step of faith. Sometimes it's just stepping out. But I promise you, when you serve him and you, and you surrender, you'll look back in five years, you'll be like, man, but God. God did this. God can take you places and do things in your life you never imagined. See, when you start to worry, you stop trusting. But when you start to trust, you stop worrying. That's what we got to do. We need to change those thought patterns. Change them. Because he said he would give you everything you need. So today, if you've struggled with worry, that cycle where you, nah, let it go. As Elsa said, let it go, let it go, let it go. Put your trust and faith in him. He'll provide for you. The last one, one more I want to talk about real quickly is sadness. It's sadness. There was moments where Jesus felt sad. There's one in Luke, Luke chapter 19, 41. It says, but as Jesus came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead and began to weep. And he began to weep because when he saw them, it, it wrecked him. And he said, I, I want to, he wants to bring them close. It was making him sad because he knew that they weren't, go, everybody was going, well, not everybody, but most people were going to reject what he, what he said, what he did. He knew the rejection was coming. He, he'd been pouring out himself, and it hurt him so bad, it just it brought him great sadness to know that what was about to happen, although it had to happen. He was crying over the people that he loved and wanted to help so badly. And you remember last week, Pastor talked about the funeral possession that brought Jesus great sadness. It was a single mother who had lost her son. But the Bible says that he saw, Jesus saw her, See, if we want to feel what Jesus feel, feels, we have sometimes have to see what he sees. We have to get our minds off of this. See, what happens is when you get so consumed with your daily stuff, then you'll pass, the, you'll pass by that person that maybe is hurting. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've been in here, and, you know, and I try to speak to people and greet people, and I try to be... I try to be alert and focused, and there's been times where I'll say, hey, you're doing good, you're doing good, and all of a sudden, I'll come back and I'll say, are you really, are you doing good? And tears are starting to roll, and I say, no, I, I'm struggling. See, if I was so focused on the natural, which I do from time to time, if I was so fat, I might just walk right on by that, but that's what the enemy does. He wants to get your mind so focused on the here and now, the natural, that you forget those around us. Jesus saw people. He saw their needs, and he met their needs, and that's what we've got to be, that's what we've got to be about. To understand why he cried, we must remember why he came. 
He came to bring life and life more abundantly. He came to seek and to save all who were lost. He came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, recovery of sight to the blind. He came to set the captives free. So I wonder now if we could change our mindset and live life that way. And there's another part of sadness I want to hit real quick. I, I, didn't, I didn't put it in my notes. I did it the first service, and I, I'm going I'm to hit it real good. I don't, have, I don't even have a scripture for you, but I, I just, I'm going to hit this. Another one is grief, the emotion of grief. I've told this before, and the worship team, you guys can come on. I've told this story many times, but I know what grief feels like. For those maybe never heard it before, when I was 17, the day after Christmas, I was a senior in high school, my parents were on their way to pick me up for a Christmas gathering. A Marine crossed the center line, hit them head on, and all three died at the scene. You're talking about a, a wake-up call at 17, man. I mean, at that point, you know, I had my own car. I was working. I had my own money. had a little girlfriend. was playing ball. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I was living it up, you know. But just that quick, I realized how fragile life can be. And I thank God, it was the mercy of God that allowed me to grieve in a healthy way. It still hurts me today. There's some times when all of a sudden, like the other week, Pastor Jason began to talk about his mom passing away, and I was back there doing a live stream, and I began to feel that emotion. It still comes back. It's healthy. But sometimes people, they, we don't handle grief the same way. Everybody don't. So oftentimes I pray in my prayer time, God, I pray that they would have a healthy grieving process. Because some people stay in that moment of grief for years. And they can't get over it. And I'm not here today talking about just a death of a loved one or a friend. Maybe... Maybe you did all you could do and your marriage did not make it. And you, you feel this grief. You feel this pain. Why me? Why did this happen to me? And I want to encourage you today to let the grief, let the grief have its, let it do its perfect work in your heart. If you feel those moments to cry, cry about it. Don't try to cover it up and mask it. Embrace the pain. That may sound contrary, but it's not. I don't, I don't even have, I'm just telling you from my own experience. Embrace the pain. Talk about the good. I mean, I, used, I love talking about my parents. It, it, it gives me comfort to talk about the good times. Reach out. It could be the death of a dream. Maybe it's something you dreamed about and somehow it just got ripped out from you and you just haven't recovered. You see, that, that sadness, that grief can set in in such a way, and it can rob you. It robs your peace. It robs your joy. It's trying to get you to stay in that, that place. But I'm here to tell you today that, that God loves you with an everlasting love. He knows what it feels. He knows what it feels like. He's here to meet your needs today. If you guys can stand to your feet. I'm going to go ahead and close it right here. I don't know if y'all clapping because I'm closing or just because it was good. <laughs> I'm going to take it the right way. You know, it's so funny. We, I was going to mention this earlier. I don't know why I'm mentioning it right now, just because I'm weird that way. But, you know, we can be so, we know the right things to say. We know the right things to do. But a lot of times, there's power in our words. And just a couple weeks ago, I, I spoke on a Wednesday night down here, and I, I preached out of Matthew chapter 11. And I preached about our words and, you know, being called out for stuff. And, and I just didn't feel like, sometimes you just feel like you just didn't do it, you know. And I was out in the lobby and Miss Banika here, she came up and she said, Pastor, I took some notes. And I, I started saying, yeah, thank you, Miss Banika. I said, but I just, man, I just felt so bad tonight. I feel like I want, you know, I just going on, I just going on, just spearing. And she said, didn't, won't you just in there preaching about words and what you say? 
I said, you know what? And I, ca- I preached about calling people out. I said, you called me out too, didn't you? Speak life. Troy, speak life. When you feel like that you're a failure, speak life. Thank God for life. Hey, if you're here today and you never accepted Jesus as your Savior, maybe you've been in church, maybe you, you know about him in your mind, but you've never surrendered your heart and never gave him full access, I'm going to be right down here. If you would take a step of faith, come tap me on your shoulder and say, Pastor Troy, will you pray for me? I would love to pray for you. I would love to pray with you. If you were here tonight, I'm going to ask, I mean, today, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come back, if you would, as we close. If you're here today and you've struggled with anger, a cycle of anger, and you need to get rid of it, whether it's the outburst or the silent anger, maybe you're the worry wart. You got to let the worry go. Maybe it's sad. Maybe it's grief. Maybe you're just struggling with something and you just need somebody to maybe put their arms around you and pray for you. I want to invite you to come down. Come down and get prayer. God loves you. He wants to do it for you. Is that good? Does that work? So let's, let's take some time to worship. Come on down if you need prayer for anything. Prayer team, come on down.